Hello everyone. Thank you to Sister Margaret, Dorothy Filaramo, Brother Jim Simon, and the 125th Anniversary Committee for trusting me with this endeavor. When I received the phone call from Brother Jim asking me to speak about St. Catherine of Siena as part of this series, I was holding a four or maybe five month old baby who was temporarily quiet enough for me to speak with an adult live on the phone. I know it doesn't seem like much, but in that moment, that was a pretty big accomplishment. So imagining a time when I would be apart from him for a whole school day or ever have enough time to sit down and contemplate and write about the life of this great saint and doctor of our church seemed pretty nearly impossible. So of course I said, yes, absolutely, I would love to. What an honor. Then several weeks later, I wrote to Brother Jim basically asking, what did I agree to again? So here we are. Hopefully I've gotten the assignment right. I, perhaps an unlikely but very willing participant, am going to try to guide us through the life of Catherine Benincasa, who lived during the Middle Ages in Siena, Italy, and was the 25th of 26 children. Yes, please take a moment to absorb that. Catherine was born into a very big, very pious Catholic family. Her father, Jacopo Benincasa, was a wool dyer, and her mother, Lapa di Puccio di Piacente, I asked Miss Mazzara and Miss Bruno for help with that pronunciation, so hopefully I did okay. Lapa, Catherine's mother, managed her, their gigantic household with tenacity, faith, and courage from all accounts. Catherine and her twin, Giovanna, who died in infancy, were born on the Feast of the Annunciation, March 25th, 1347. Siena was a prosperous and charitable city that was also often at war with its neighbor, Florence. If these seem like contradictory realities, you're right, but this is the context in which Catherine grew up. The Sienese people were business people who were skilled at various crafts. They took deep pride in their city, in their churches and buildings, and they cared for the poor and vulnerable in their community. The Benin Casa family did as well. So Catherine was a tenacious and imaginative child who was also deeply religious even from a very young age. So before we go any further, I should note that I am not an academic expert on St. Catherine of Siena by any stretch of the imagination. Any of the facts are directly from her biography written by Sacred Onset, published originally in 1951. I do, however, consider myself a serendipitous devotee of Catherine's, which is why I said yes to this opportunity immediately. So back to Catherine. She received visions of Christ as a child. She experienced religious ecstasy and the stigmata later in life. She was a mystic who devoted her life to God from a young age, refusing to marry as was expected of her at the time. She joined the Dominicans but was committed to an active ministry rather than a cloistered existence. She was devoted to ministering to the sick and the poor. She had an active and imaginative spiritual life, but was simultaneously remarkably grounded in the world and the realities of those around her. She was an advocate and reformer of the church and was involved in its politics of the time. During a time of division in the Catholic Church, she advocated for peace and reunification by convincing Pope Gregory XI to return to Rome from Avignon, France, and she did this by traveling there to speak to him directly. 
Now this may not seem like a great feat now, but at the time when women's roles were typically more domestic and even when religious women's lives were also more hidden, the fact that Catherine took this journey and advocated for reform in the church in such a direct and public manner was indeed exceptional. So what does this saint from the Middle Ages, who seems to have been really pious her whole life, who experienced religious ecstasy, who had little talks with God, another book, and who convinced the Pope to move back to Rome, have to do with us here today. To be honest, when I read through some of Catherine's written accounts in her book, Little Talks with God, I thought to myself, oh geez, how am I going to explain some of this content to a 21st century audience? Particularly the fact that these are basically accounts of her conversations with God, where God has provided her with actual answers. When was the last time God responded to your questions in several paragraphs detailing the intricacies of whatever question you're pondering? I mean, maybe it's just me, but this is not how I've experienced prayer in my life. Has prayer helped me? Yes. Has prayer grounded me? Definitely. Has prayer united me to people far away from me? Absolutely. Has prayer comforted me, challenged me? Yes, yes. But I can't say I've ever received actual long answers from God communicated as such as depicted in this work. I also haven't had any visions of Christ or received the stigmata, still haven't met the Pope or reformed the church. This does not mean that Catherine's experience is completely unrelatable. In Catherine's chapter on prayer, she recounts God's words to her on how the soul proceeds from vocal to mental prayer. This is a quote. But do not think that the soul receives such ardor and nourishment from prayer if it prays only vocally, as do many souls whose prayers are words rather than love. Such as these give heed to nothing except to completing psalms and saying many our fathers. And once they have completed their appointed tale, they do not think of anything further, but seem to place devout attention and love in mere vocal recitation. But the soul is not required to do this, for in doing only this, it bears but little fruit, but pleases, which pleases me but little. So that was God to St. Catherine of Siena. So God told her all of this and she wrote it down. Again, not quite my experience of prayer, but I like the message, right? If we sift through some of the dense language and complicated sentence structure, we can find a message that is relatable. Whose prayers are words rather than love. I'm sure we can all think of some examples of this, right? I mean, how many times have we heard the words, the victims of X tragedy are in our thoughts and prayers, and then seen exactly no follow through, no action to support healing, to change systems, to work for justice in our world, no work to bring about God's kingdom on earth. And we've heard and seen this message before. The first thing that came to my mind upon reading that excerpt from her book was from the letter of St. James on faith and works. So James chapter 2, verses 14 through 19, faith and works. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, 
but you do not give him the necessities of the body, what good is it? So also faith of itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Indeed, someone may say, you have faith and I have works. Demonstrate your faith to me without works, and I will demonstrate my faith to you from my works. You believe that God is well, one, you do well. Even the demons believe that and tremble. So Catherine's answer from God is not exactly new. It's been at the core of Christianity from the beginning. We see this message time and time again in Christ's own interactions and words. Should he heal someone on the Sabbath? What does it take to get into heaven? Are following the rules enough? What does it really mean to love my neighbor as myself? Who even is my neighbor? So we are compelled as followers of Christ to act, but how, when, where are we supposed to act? This is where prayer comes in. A prayer life is something we have to actively cultivate in our lives through daily practice. Developing a relationship with God through prayer can and will help us to act more intentionally towards bringing about God's will, God's kingdom on earth, and working towards creating a more just, inclusive, and loving world. I like to think about prayer with God like keeping up with a good friend. For a friendship to grow and be nourished over time, you have to spend time together. You check in on each other, show interest in each other's lives. All of this happens in pretty ordinary ways, usually. When we're in the midst of a crisis, we don't generally reach out to someone we haven't heard from in years. Although sometimes this does work out, usually we want to be surrounded by people who know us, who have accompanied us, whom we can count on. The difference, of course, is that God is always there waiting for us to return, to check in, to send a quick text. Hey, how's your day been? Humans are humans. Most of us are require a little bit of support from the people in our lives at some point. We're not totally selfless in our love and friendships. That's where we differ, obviously, in God in this metaphor. But to cultivate a relationship with God through prayer, it does help to check in on at least a somewhat regular basis. Back to faith without works is dead. We must do the work, put in the time, act with love, but we must also spend time nurturing our spiritual life through prayer. What occurred to me when I was reflecting on St. Catherine's life is that she was very likely much, much more inclined or predisposed to hear God through prayer than many of us might be naturally in our context, in our time. I mean, there were far fewer distractions, right? I really don't think toddler Catherine was watching Daniel Tiger or Peppa Pig. I don't think teenage Catherine definitely was not focused on choosing the best Snapchat filter. That's a thing, right? You know what I mean, though. She wasn't concerned with curating her social media persona. And young adult Catherine made it very clear that she was not interested in marriage or motherhood. What was she doing instead? She was learning prayers from her family members, playing imaginative games, walking through the beautiful Sienese churches, spending time with religious people, devoting her life to God and the poor. I imagine this sounds pretty far from most people's daily experiences, but this does not mean that that prayer and closeness to God are unattainable for the modern Catherines. It just means that it might look a little different for most of us. It might take the form of a quiet moment on our commutes, maybe time spent in nature, being present to our family and friends, during mealtime, reaching out to someone in need, and it might also happen in church, praying with a community, celebrating the Eucharist, singing a song, volunteering in your parish. 
I once heard a metaphor for mindfulness using kayaking as an example. The presenter explained that if you look at the motion of a kayaker, it may seem like constant, rapid, even motion. One side of the paddle in the water, one out, one in, one out, etc. The speaker pointed out that in between each of those strokes, though, there is actually a brief moment of stillness and pause. So too, even in the busyness and chaos of modern life, where we may feel constantly accessible, running from one thing to the next, can we find that brief moment of pause between dipping the paddle back into the water, propelling us forward? So take that moment to center yourself, to become aware of God's presence in your life, in the world around you, take a breath and then allow it to continue to propel you forward moving towards the work of creating a more just inclusive and loving world towards bringing about the kingdom of god on earth catherine was perhaps due to circumstances of her time and context and upbringing more predisposed to being aware of God's will and presence in her life in these really remarkable ways. But we are all able to find more moments of quiet and stillness between the frenetic activities of the modern world. We can become more aware of God's presence in our lives and the world around us. And then, as we become more aware of God's presence, we can also become more aware of God's will for our lives, the direction our lives will take in order to do as Catherine urged us and be who, you, who God made you to be and you will set the world on fire. Thank you.